Well, what a joy it is for me to be with you, and I'm normally on a Sunday in Dallas, Texas, uh, preaching at Trinity Bible Church of Dallas and preaching through the book of Colossians. We just finished preaching through the book of Genesis, and so now here I am on the other side of the world, and I am at the epicenter of evangelicalism right here at Emmanuel Baptist Church, and I'm so grateful uh, for this opportunity. I've been here the last several days and have enjoyed immensely having a conference with the pastors um, on how to preach the Bible. And then yesterday and the day before, we had a special conference here with the a -B or AFBC um, conference, and now here I am. So I do want to commend your pastor to you. I don't know who is the most gifted preacher in all of Australia, but uh, I cannot believe anyone is more gifted than your preacher, and we are so proud of him in Los Angeles as he's graduated from the Master's Seminary from our Doctor of Ministry program, and uh, to see him now in his home church and to be here uh, causes my appreciation to soar even higher, but God must have great plans for this church to bring such a gifted expositor and to plant him right here, and he is at such a young age that the future for this church is uh, wonderful, and the bloom is on the rose, and the sun is rising, and um, God is at work here in a wonderful way. So this morning, it's difficult to know exactly what to preach on when I'm just airdropped in and have only this opportunity uh, to preach. I'll be here tonight as well. And so through uh, the inside of your pastor and perhaps others in his ear, uh, this morning I want to preach to you Psalm 1 and tonight Psalm 2. So if you would take your Bible and turn with me to Psalm 1, I want to begin by reading what will be our passage uh, for this morning. And then uh, I will read it, and then I will exposit uh, the passage. So, the title of this is, The Two Roads of Life. I want to begin by reading Psalm 1, verse 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. In these verses, the psalmist lays before us the two roads of life, and there are only two roads. There are not three, there are not four, there are not ten. Everyone here today is traveling one of two roads. Everyone in Australia is on one of two roads. And they are headed in two opposite directions. They are traveled by two opposite crowds. And they have two totally opposite worldviews, and they live two totally opposite lifestyles, and they are headed to two totally opposite destinations. They are as different as night is to day, as heaven is to hell, as God is to the devil, as truth is to lies. We have presented for us these two roads. As we consider this first psalm, there are some important features to which I need to draw your attention. And it is to say 
that I believe that we can reasonably assume that this is the most important psalm of the entire Psalter. If you were to be familiar with any one psalm, it would be this psalm because it has been intentionally placed here by the compilers of this book. It's not the first psalm to be written. The first psalm to be written was Psalm 90. It was written by Moses during his wilderness wanderings at least 1,400 years before the coming of Christ. And the last psalm to be written was Psalm 126, which was written some 400 years before the coming of Christ. And so the book of Psalms is a a book that took a thousand years to produce. And there was a committee of compilers who made strategic decisions which psalm would go in which order. They're not laid out in chronological order. And so as they compiled the book of Psalms, they first compiled simply the first 41 Psalms. That was book one. And then after a period of time, Psalm 42 and following, and then after an extended period of time, uh, book three, then book four, and then book five, in reality, the book of Psalms is compiled in five different collections, uh, representing really the five books of the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And as the compilers piece together this book over an extended period of time, they made the decision led by the Spirit of God to place Psalm 1 first, so that everyone who enters into the book of Psalms must walk past this first psalm. And it is a call to every worshiper to examine themselves, which path are you traveling? Because it's possible to be in the house of the Lord and yet not be in the Lord. It's possible to be in a worship service, but not know the Lord to whom you are singing praises. And so, this psalm is really an evangelistic psalm. This is a psalm that separates the wheat from the tares. It is a psalm that is intentionally making a sharp contrast between a true believer and one who merely masquerades as a true believer. In other words, it is possible to profess the Lord, yet not possess the Lord. It is possible to sing praises with the lips, yet not know the Lord in the heart. And so, this psalm is, as I have said, very evangelistic. And what makes this psalm so potent is is that both of these two groups that are on the way of the righteous and on the way of the wicked, they're all in church together. And they're singing from the same hymnal. And they're listening to the same sermon. And they are under the same exposition of the Word. Just like it was with Jesus and the twelve, eleven knew the Lord, but one did not know the Lord, Judas. And this psalm is a recognition, again, that it is possible to be in church here today and not know the Lord Jesus Christ. It's possible to have given a testimony that does not have a life that backs it up. And so, this is a very important psalm and should serve to cause each one of us to examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith. And so, let's walk through this psalm. It breaks out very easily. The first three verses is the way of the righteous. The last three verses are the way of the wicked. And every one of us here today find themselves in one, on one of these two paths. 
Let's begin with the way of the righteous, verses 1 through 3. This is a description of your life. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, this is your life. In varying degrees, some here today will separate themselves from the world more than others, and some here today will meditate on the law of the Lord more than others. And some here today will have more fruit being produced in their lives than others. But nevertheless, categorically, verses 1 through 3 should be like you looking into a mirror and seeing yourself, this is your Christian life. So he begins, how blessed is the man. No book and the Bible starts more positively does, than does the book of Psalms. No book in any library around the globe starts with a more positive beginning than does the book of Psalms, how blessed is the man, and we can say how blessed is the woman. It begins with this outburst of pronounced blessing that rests upon your head. If you are a true believer in the Lord, this man, how blessed is the man, is identified in verse 5 and in verse 6 as the righteous. One who has been declared righteous by faith in God and one who is now living a righteous life. Now, the word blessed means to be favored. It means to be graced. It means to be attended by great, abundant blessings, though we cannot see it in our English Bible, in the original Hebrew with which this was written, blessed is in the plural and should really be translated, oh, the blessednesses. That, that's why the word how is added in the English translation to try to intensify this and give us some understanding of the abundant, overflowing blessings that God has poured out upon your head. It, it, it's not blessings that have come to you with a little eyedropper and there are just a few little mercy drops that have come down from the throne of God upon your life, but that God has opened the floodgates of heaven, and there has been a deluge of blessing that has been poured from the throne of grace upon your life. You are so blessed in the Lord. And there are several things I need to say to you before we go any further, how blessed is the man. Number one, it is implied here that God is the bestower of these blessings. It is God Himself who has blessed you. Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen to this, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Sometimes I'll have someone come up to me and say, have you had the second blessing? <laughs> and I just laugh, second? I've had them all. <laughs> every spiritual blessing, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, the only second blessing that there is is to realize you got it all the first time. Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And the word abundantly means His supply far exceeds your needs. But whatever your needs are, His supply far exceeds it. And James 1 verse 17 says, every, every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above, 
from the father of unshifting shadows with whom there is no variation. That is to say, there is a steady stream of blessing that is pouring out of heaven every moment of every day upon your life and upon your soul. These blessings belong only to to the righteous. These blessings begin the moment you walk through the narrow gate and enter into the kingdom of God, and accompanying these blessings are joy and peace and contentment and satisfaction. And this joy is very different from happiness. Happiness is dependent upon your happenings. And when your happenings are good, you're happy. And when your happenings are not so good, you lose your happiness. When your football team wins, you're happy. When they lose, you're not happy. Even unbelievers can be happy. Even unbelievers can get married. Even unbelievers can get a promotion. Even unbelievers can go on a vacation. Even unbelievers can be, have moments of happiness because it's all dependent upon their circumstances. But this blessedness is not dependent upon what's going on around you. This blessedness is dependent upon the Lord who never changes and who is constant and who is continually in your life and who is supplying everything that you need. And you can even be like the Apostle Paul and be in prison and be in chain to Roman soldiers and you can say, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice and have 10,000 joys in your heart even when your circumstances are difficult and painful and challenging. How blessed are you in the Lord? Now, he continues, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. He begins with some negatives. And in order for you to experience the fullness of this blessing, there needs to be some negatives in your Christian life. He will advance to the positives in verses 2 and 3, but these are the heads and tails of the same coin. This is the way the Christian life works. There has to be a negative separation from certain things and a positive saturation with other things. So he begins with three negatives, and the three are for dramatic emphasis. There's a certain shock value as we read this. He he starts so positive, how blessed is the man, and then goes, not, nor, nor. So he says, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. The counsel of the wicked is a secular worldview. It is, it, it is a humanistic philosophy. It is man's attempt to provide the solutions to his problems. And the blessed man turns a deaf ear to the counsel of the wicked. The wicked here refer to the ungodly, and to walk refers to one's, one's lifestyle the path that you're walking. And the blessed man does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Uh, This blessed man refuses the worldly agenda. 
he or she refuses secular philosophy and godless beliefs. For us today, this counsel comes from left-wing politicians. It comes from biased news anchors. It comes from godless movie stars. It comes from heathen rock stars. It comes from atheistic educators. It comes from liberal theologians. It comes from best-selling authors. It comes from medical experts. It comes from false religious leaders. It's the same bottle of poison. It just has different spouts out of which it is coming. And the one who is to be blessed by God must not walk in the counsel of the wicked. It comes in many forms. It it says there are many ways to God. It, It says there are many forms of birth control, and abortion is one of them. It says there are many genders from which you can choose after your birth. It says there are many forms of marriage, including two men together or two women together. It says there are many forms of right and wrong. You have yours, I have mine. Can you not hear the hiss of the serpent in that? The blessed man shuts that down from entering into his mindset. And then he says, nor stand in the path of sinners. And there's a progression here from walking to standing, and the implication is you, if you hear it and if you give it entrance into your life, you're going to slow down until you're standing so you can take more in. And the righteous man doesn't stop and stand. He refuses it. The path of sinners is a slippery slope. It leads to eternal destruction. And the blessed man refuses to be in certain places. He refuses to be with certain groups. He refuses to be in certain churches. He refuses to have certain associations knowing that 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, bad company corrupts good morals. You tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are or who you are soon to become. You tell me what TV programs you watch, what books you read, and I'll tell you who you are or who you are in the process of becoming. And then he adds, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. And the progression here goes from walking to standing to sitting. And if you don't tap the brakes and resist the world's agenda, you're going to be sucked in and lured in until you're sitting at the table with scoffers. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a slow seduction. It's like the frog in the kettle doesn't realize it's being boiled nor sit in the seat of scoffers, scorners, those who ridicule God's way of life. Aren't we supposed to go witness to them? Yes, but they better be the mission field, not you. Do not cast your pearls before swine. If they're scoffers, you cut off. So this blessed man, he just outright refuses to adopt worldly thinking, refuses to entertain worldly values, refuses to travel worldly paths, refuses to join worldly causes. He refuses to go with the flow of this world and to go the course of this world, refuses to try to fit into the system because it's the devil's system. He's the God of this age. He is the prince of the power of the air. 
And that sounds almost old-fashioned, doesn't it? Yeah, it's called 3,000 years old fashion when this was written. And so let me ask you this before we go any further. Are you strong enough in your Christian faith to say no to the world's agenda, to the world's lures, to the world's lies, to the world's lifestyles? You need to make up your mind this morning how you're going to respond when the world comes courting you. You need to decide now before the heat of the moment, are you going to say no to the entrance of the world into your mind and into your heart? Because if it finds entrance, it will be devastating for you. We come to verse 2, now is the positive. And he started with the negative for dramatic effect, and he put it in threefold for dramatic emphasis. He now comes to the positive, verse 2, but, and what a sharp contrast. Now the other side of the coin, and it's got to be both, both and, both the negative and the positive. If it's only the negative, it leads to legalism. You're just known by everything you don't do. And if it's only verses 2 and 3, the positive, that, that leads to licentiousness, uh, antinomianism. It's got to be both and, both a negative and a positive. And, and that's what, when we read the New Testament, we put off the old man and put on the new man. It's the way the Christian life works at maximum effectiveness. So now here's the positive, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. This word delight, it means a deep longing, a deep longing and a strong desire. His heart's in another place. He doesn't love sin. He loves God's Word. And the reason for this is he's been given a new heart. So he now has new affections and new desires and new passions and, and new thirsts. It's an evidence of the, of the new birth. And so his delight is in the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord here refers to divine instruction that is contained in the written Word of God. At this point, it refers to the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It also refers to those historical books that were already written to this point. And as each subsequent book would be written and be recognized as a part of the canon of Scripture, the fence posts would be moving out to include all 66 books in the Bible, which at this point have not yet been written, but there is a God-given supernatural love for the Word of God. I mean, if you're a true believer in Jesus Christ today, I know something about you. I know something about your heart. I know that you delight in God's Word. I know you don't have to be entertained when you come to church. I know that you don't need some big production up here to treat you like a child. I, I, I know that as you've come to church today, if you're a true believer in Jesus Christ, there is a spiritual appetite in your soul for the law of the Lord. And you want more of it. And that's why there's a Sunday night service, because Sunday morning didn't do it all. I, I, I need more of the Word. 
And that's why then after Sunday night you go home and, and you get out your Bible before you go to bed at night and you read a portion of Scripture and you wake up the next morning and, and you want more of the Word of God and, and you listen to a podcast so you can hear some more of the Word being taught and being preached and you pick up a book and you begin to read it. You, you, you just are like a vacuum cleaner. You want more and more and more of the Word of God. You're not being bored by the Word of God. You're being excited about the Word of God. And the word enthusiasm in theos, two Greek words, means in God. All true excitement and all true enthusiasm is in God, and it's in the Word of God. I mean, this book is more precious than gold and silver. It's sweeter than honey. The more you eat into this book, the more you want more of it. And so his delight is in the law of the Lord. Listen to 1 Peter 2, verse 2. Like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the Word, that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. My wife and I now have our first grandchild, and that little grandbaby lets us know when she's hungry. And if she was not crying out at a certain time, you know what we would do? We would panic. We would grab her up and put her in the car and rush to the hospital and go sprinting into the emergency room. Something is wrong because she is not clamoring for more milk and food. That's what happens in your spiritual life. And if there is a loss of appetite for the Word of God, you know what? Something's wrong with your life. Something is seriously wrong. If there is not a desire to, to have more of the Word. And one of the best things to happen to this church, not only to bring a Bible preacher into this pulpit, you, you've got a bookstore getting ready to start. And you can buy books and, and read and have more of the Word of God coming into your life. It produces spiritual vitality. It produces spiritual strength. It, it, it produces a spiritual dynamic in your life. Colossians 3, verse 16, let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you. Let it move into your life and stay, not like an overnight guest, but like a brother-in-law who won't leave. And then he adds, in his law, he meditates. On just Sunday morning, just a couple times during the week, and in his law, he meditates day and night, day and night, day and night. This word meditate means that you fix your mind upon it. The word literally in the Hebrew means to moan or to groan or to mutter, and it, it makes a, a sound like this. Mmm. Mmm. This is good. This is good. To meditate means to reflect upon it. And turn it over and over and over in your mind and to contemplate it and to, to process it and to replay it in your mind again and again and again until it's internalized with, with, within you that the Word of God just now dominates your thinking and your life and the Word of God now becomes the, the, the prism through which you see all of life, almost like a, a pair of glasses in, in front of you, and it becomes your world view, and it's how you size up everything in life. You, you, you see it 
through the lens of the Word of God. You don't know how to think outside of the Word of God. You see everything through the Word of God. And then it says day and night. That means all day, every day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. There's never a sabbatical from the Word of God. There's never a day off from the Word of God. There's never a vacation away from the Word of God. But you meditate upon it in season and out of season, in good times, in bad times, in prosperity, in adversity, in trials, in triumphs. I mean, you're just constant. It's your reference point. It's the plumb line by which you align all of your thinking according to the Word of God. In verse 3, the psalmist is such a master teacher and master communicator. He not only tells us in verse 2 that we meditate upon the Word of God, But in verse 3, he shows us what it is like in a life that is dominated by the Word. Again, this is your life. This this is your life right here, verse 3. He, referring to the righteous man, the righteous woman, He will be. There's a note of certainty about this. Not might be, could be, should be. He will be. You will be. Like, it's a simile, a figure of speech, metaphor. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. Now, this tree did not start out by streams of water. It had to be transplanted. And it is to be understood from this analogy that it began in a barren wasteland. This tree was a dying, perishing stub in a desert. It was dying. There was no greenery, and someone came along and uprooted it out of the desert, out of the wasteland, and carried it where there, to a garden where there are streams of water and planted it there. This, by inference, is a picture of the new birth. There's been a change of location of your heart and your soul from the scorching desert of this godless world where you and I once lived, and the Spirit of God has transplanted us and moved us to an entirely different location And we are now rooted and grounded in Christ and planted in the most strategic place by streams of water. You've been replanted. And if you're a Christian, this is what's happened to you. Please note it says streams, plural, indicating the abundant supply. (laughs) There's more water in these streams than this one little tree could ever pull up through the roots and send sap up into the, in, in the branches. There's an abundant supply, streams of, of, of water. And in days of drought, when everyone else all around you is, is just dying on the vine, and they, they are struggling through life, and they are, they, they, they are just perishing, you are thriving. You, you stand out in the midst of what's going on in this world. The, the, all of Australia during the COVID, 
just shut down. And you were growing because you were planted by streams of water, an abundant supply of, of water. Everyone else is shriveling up and withering and, and dying, but you have an underground supply of resources that this world knows nothing of. Water here, streams of water, the water here represents the Word of God, the law of the Lord in verse 2. And the reason why you're not just surviving, you are thriving, is because streams of water, the Word of God, is replenishing you and reviving you and causing your growth to the point, it says in verse 3, this tree, that's you, yields its fruit in its season. You're very fruitful. And when it says in its season, the idea is when you need it. When you need wisdom, the Word of God just pumps it into your soul. When you need strength, when you need stamina, when you need patience, when you need uh, endurance, when you need love, when you need peace, when you need joy, these streams of water just keep being pulled up into your life from the Word of God, and it's, trans, it's translated, it's transformed into what you need. You, you have everything that you need. You have access to everything you need. You will never face any situation the rest of your life, but that you do not have access to more than abundant resources, spiritually speaking, to live a dynamic, triumphant life in Jesus Christ. And then he adds, and its leaf does not wither. <laughs> it's lush, it's green, it's healthy, it will flourish. There is a constancy about this life. This person who lives this life tapped into streams of water is not living an emotional roller coaster of a Christian life up and down and up and down and up and down and in and out and all around. No, its leaf does not wither. It's an evergreen tree. It's evergreen, whatever the season of your life is. And then he caps it off, and whatever he does, whether it's work, whether at home, whether in worship, whatever He does, that, that covers the whole spectrum of your life. There's no part of your life lived outside of whatever. Whatever He does, He prospers. Now, this is not teaching the prosperity gospel. I want you to know that. So, let me put up a negative denial and then a positive assertion. This is prosperity as God defines prosperity, which is that your soul prospers, that your heart prospers. The word for prospers here literally means advances, makes progress. The idea is growth, moving forward. We could say it means to fulfill the purpose for which you have been created. 
and to fulfill the good works that have been foreordained for you to accomplish. This is a picture of your Christian life. It's prolific. It's prosperous. It's inexplicable. Apart from the grace of God at work in your life. You may be a widow here today without your spouse, but you're still thriving. You may be a single adult here without a spouse, you're still thriving. You may be a single parent here today without a spouse, you are still thriving. There is more than enough in these streams to cause you to prosper and to walk on the sunny side of Hallelujah Avenue. So that's the way of the righteous. It's as good as it gets. You know, the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. It's not hard to be a Christian. It's glorious to be a Christian. There are challenges to be a Christian. Nothing hard about this. Now, the way of the wicked. Sharp contrast. These are walking another path. And let me give it to you in one word. They are worthless. Worthless. They live an empty, shallow hollow, meaningless, worthless life that amounts to nothing. So look at verse 4. The wicked are not so. The wicked here were were mentioned in verse 1, the counsel of the wicked. Oh, and they, they, they walk in the counsel of the wicked. They are wicked. Now, they may be outwardly charitable. They may be outwardly kind. They, they, they may be involved in community work. Uh, they may even serve in the church. They may be outwardly religious. They may be the best next-door neighbor. They're just inwardly rotten. They have wicked thoughts. They have wicked desires. And once church is over, they go back to being who they really are. They are religious but lost. They are religious but unregenerate. They are still living in a barren wasteland. Their body is in the house of the Lord, but their heart is immersed in the kingdoms of this world. And even when in church and the Word of God is being ministered, their mind is still miles away. They're cutting a deal. They are absorbed with thoughts of worldly things in another place. They're not focused upon the truth of the Word of God that they are daydreaming, they are fantasizing in their mind about how to get ahead in the world, how to succeed in the world. No, this is the wicked. They're in the house of the Lord. It says the wicked are not so. Literally in the Hebrew, the, the order is reversed, and it is literally translated, not so the wicked, where the emphasis is upon not so. We call that the emphatic position, to draw a, a line under it. Are the wicked blessed? Not so. Are the wicked joyful? Not so. Are the wicked fruitful? Not so. Are the wicked prosperous? Not so. They may look successful. They may laugh at parties. They may laugh at jokes. They may be entertained by the things of the world, but they are empty. They are hollow. They are vain. Not so. The wicked. 
They walk in the counsel of the wicked. They stand in the path of sinners. They sit in the seat of scoffers Monday through Friday. They just happen to show up once a week. And here's the description of them, verse 4, they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. The chaff is the worthless hus that the wind just drives away. And here's, here's the imagery. Here's a field with wheat growing, and the highest hill on this farm, the highest hill is where the wind blows the strongest, and that's where the farmer builds a threshing floor, which is made out of stone, and he harvests his, his wheat and he takes it up to this mountain where the wind is blowing the strongest, and he would take something like today, a pitchfork, but be able to throw the grain up into the air, and the wind is so strong that it creates a separation such that the weightier grain falls down to the threshing floor, can be gathered up, taken to market, and, and sold or taken home and eaten, but the the outer hus are just worthless, and the wind just blows them away. They're, they're, they're good for nothing. They, they can't be taken to market and sold. They can't be taken home and, and eaten. They, 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 they are spiritual lightweights. In fact, they're just empty of any spiritual reality in their life. There is no gravitas, no gravity uh, uh, about them. So, there is this separation that's coming. It's coming on the last day. There's going to be a separation of everyone who's here today. There's going to be a separation in every church. There's going to be a separation in the community. That day is coming. And so, he describes it in verse 5, therefore, in other words, as a result of this picture, the wicked, who we just referenced in verse 4, will not stand in the judgment. Oh, they'll be in the judgment. They just won't stand with God's approval in the judgment. They will be swept away into the bowels of hell. They will be sent away. And he further describes that at the end of verse 5, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous, <laughs> they, 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 they are in the assembly right now, but the day is coming when they will no longer be in the assembly of the righteous. Right now, sinners, wicked, and righteous, they live together, they work together, they worship together, they sing together, they serve together, they may even pray together, but there is coming a day when this wind of judgment will blow and there will be this separation. There is coming a day when wives will be separated from unconverted husbands, when parents will be separated from unconverted sons and daughters, when pastors will be separated from unconverted church members, when Sunday school teachers will be separated from unconverted class members, how great will the separation be on the last day? That's why this psalm is placed first. It's for every one of us to check our oil, for every one of us to examine ourselves, whether we're truly born again or just in church. And so, we read verse 6, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous. This word knows, yada in the Hebrew means to be intimately acquainted with, to be intimately involved with, to be lovingly involved with the way of the righteous. Of course He is. He walks with us. He goes with us. 
He never departs from us. He goes before us. He comes in behind us. He's under us to uphold us every step of the way. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows your way. Not just knows about, but He experientially knows you. And you experientially know Him. John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true living God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them from my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one may pluck them from his hand. I and the Father are one. Of course it says, the Lord knows the way of the righteous every step of the way. At the end of verse 6, but the way of the wicked will perish. That's not annihilation, that's damnation. We'll undergo eternal destruction. Be ever dying but never dying. To be ever perishing yet never perished throughout all of the ages to come. What a contrast. What a contrast between the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. It's all black and white. There's no gray. There's no purgatory in between. There's no halfway house. You're either in or you're out. You're either a saint or an ain't. So, where is Jesus in this? Spurgeon has said, a sermon without Jesus is an awful thing. He said, it's like the day without the sun, the night without the moon. It's like a river without water. It's like the fall without a harvest. Well, as I look at this, Jesus is the great giver of law. He is the one who has spoken the law into existence and he's written it upon even our hearts and our conscience is bound to this law. Jesus did that. Jesus is the only one who's ever obeyed this law perfectly. And you and I have broken this law again and again and again. Jesus obeyed this law perfectly, and when you believe in Jesus Christ, His perfect obedience and the righteousness that comes from that perfect obedience, that's what is deposited into your account as though you have lived a sinless and perfect life, and perfect righteousness is credited to you it is imputed to you, it is declared to be yours because he fulfilled all of the demands of the law on your behalf and in your place. And the way of the righteous is in reality the Lord Jesus Christ himself who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And Jesus is the great judge in this psalm. He is the one before whom heaven and earth will flee away. He is the one at the great white throne judgment. He is the one who will say, depart from me, you who work iniquity, I never knew you. 
He is the one who produces the fruit in us. And this fruit is, in reality, Christ's likeness and becoming more and more like Christ. We can take the whole rest of the Bible and pour it through this keyhole, impose upon this, and we see that Christ is the fulfillment of this psalm. And just as Psalm 1 is the most important psalm, so the Lord Jesus Christ is the most important thing in your life. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. So as I bring this to conclusion, I want you to be encouraged. You don't look encouraged, but I want you to be encouraged. (laughs) Because you are very blessed today. You and I have every reason to rejoice in the Lord. No matter what's going on in our lives, we all have challenges. We all have speed bumps. We all all have difficulties. But the blessing of God far outshines and rises above whatever else will be going on in our lives. And as you are a witness for Jesus Christ, I think you can sell this. This is a glorious life that we offer to people, it is Christ himself. And if you've never believed in Jesus Christ, then I call you today. Today is the day to believe in Christ. Like newborn babes, you need to cry out for the Lord. Father, thank you for this time to look together into this psalm and how grateful we are that you had it placed first so that it would have our undivided attention this day. Father, bless now, even as we respond by singing to you in Jesus' name.